Uh, so I work with uh, technology and art projects of all kinds, uh, both online and in the gallery, and I'm also a producer of the IK Prize, which is an initiative based at Tate Britain. Perfect. Please, get on. Okay. Um, so as I said, I um, produce the IK Prize. Um, the IK Prize is based at Tate Britain, and it's Tate Britain's premier platform for experimenting with digital technologies. It was set up in 2013, um, and led on from a lot of work that Tate had been doing, particularly at Tate Modern, working with digital creatives of all kinds, software developers, animators, using new technologies. Tate Modern, I think, premiered the use of multimedia guides way, guides way back in 2000, uh, with the Bloomberg Connects uh, partnership, They've introduced drawing bars for children to interact with the collection, and we've just uh, created a digital timeline to represent the collection and the history of 20th century art. Um, but when we were thinking about Tate Britain in two, uh, 2013, uh, when our director was uh, relaunching the collection displays, uh, rehanging the whole collection, we were thinking about how broad audiences, new audiences, audiences that might visit the gallery, but also internationally, how they can engage with 500 years of British art. And we were thinking about that work that had been done at Tate Modern. Um, and we came up with the idea of the IK Prize, which essentially uh, is a commissioning process, but it's about finding those ideas that exist outside of the museum sector. People who aren't museum professionals are perhaps don't have much knowledge about art history, but are working really innovatively with new technologies, telling stories and engage, engaging audiences. So instead of going to people with a predefined brief, we thought we'd kind of open it up and say, what are your ideas? In the first year of the prize, um, we had a project called After Dark. That was the winner. Um, and a small production uh, studio from uh, Shoreditch in London, they developed uh, a project, a live event project, where they put robots in our galleries. That seemed like a brilliant way of offering to an international audience in a really fun way uh, the opportunity to tour our collections, take a serendipitous tour of what is a really large collection, often a very intimidating one because it's so big, but saying here's a really fun way to take your own journey through it. And it was really successful. In the second year, uh, that, that, as I say, that, I think that engaged an audience of over 100,000 people worldwide. In the second year, we wanted to think about how can we get people to the galleries? How can we get younger audiences to the galleries? Why are they perhaps not coming to the galleries? Why are they scared? So we, um, we set a brief that said, how, how can you focus audiences on a, a specific um, uh, subject or collection of artworks from our collection? And Flying Object won the prize, and this is essentially the headline. They said, which seems pretty obvious, a lot of people commented, God, that's pretty obvious, but sometimes the best ideas are. Art is inspired by, made, and exists in, refers or relates to a multi-sensory world. The whole point uh, is the museum takes our objects and puts it into a sterile environment. We're all very familiar with the critique of the white cube, but a lot of the reasons when people come is this austere, um, often reverential space can be a brilliant environment which to uh, enjoy and engage with art, but often it can be quite scary, particularly with contemporary art. There's little to go on. Uh, and at the same time, we just rehung our collections, as we said, and uh, the management had taken quite a controversial decision to remove all uh, interpretation from the collection displays. So no wall panels, no little apart from the name and uh, date and art, uh, artist name and title, everything had been removed. The idea here was to create a more visually, um, an environment which you could just focus on the visual appreciation of art. And the collection displays are beautiful, but we were still having a problem engaging with younger audiences. Why weren't they coming? Um, how could we get more people to come and enjoy and take a walk through this collection? Um, as part of that rehang, we're asking a lot of questions about what do audiences want? Do they want art history? Do they want to be given traditional information? Um, and why do people often, why are they scared of, uh, of interpreting artworks? We started thinking about, can we all be connoisseurs? What, is, what does a connoisseur do? They're not just a person with lots of, uh, this is, uh, what's he called? George Lucas, by the way, who I didn't know was an art expert, apparently, a big collection of his own, um, avid connoisseur. So even if, so if he can be a connoisseur, can we all be connoisseurs? 
What is a connoisseur? They are people with perhaps art historical backgrounds, they have lots of knowledge, theoretical understanding, but they're people who are comfortable in museums. They're comfortable walking in, they're comfortable forming an opinion, expressing an opinion, and talking about it in an engaging way. When you look at television personalities, not only do they, they don't just deliver lots of facts and, and, and hard theory, they talk really emphatically, personally, with often flowery, uh, emphatic language, why are audiences engaged, uh, empowered to do that? You don't need lots of knowledge to form a personal response. So essentially, going back to Flying Objects' proposal, their proposal is, uh, can we take a selection of artworks and encourage a more sensual, connoisseurial approach or response to art? Can we empower people um, to visit the gallery and be sensual, to respond imaginatively, to form their own opinions? What if... We put the sensorium back into the white cube. What if we, instead of, instead of interpreting through text, traditional wall panels, didactic information, what if we took a creative approach and created audio, um, olfactory, taste, and haptic um, experiences as interpretation and measured how people responded? What kind of art? Now, I did this Google the other night. <clears throat> that is actually what comes up. So we can't do this for everything. It might not be suitable as a mode of interpretation for every kind of artwork. But we uh, thought about what do people find particularly difficult to engage with? Works that aren't figurative, abstract art. Now, abstract art is a very big category, as we all know. Um, but we thought abstract art is something that does, uh, is, is so broad and does kind of demand a sort of a level of personal response. Um, so going back to their proposal. We thought that this idea of thinking about art that is made in a world that is multi-sensory, that might be a brilliant approach for a general audience to take. So we got a team together. Flying Object got a, uh, a brilliant team. We worked with this chap, Nick Ryan, who is a sound designer. He's also a synesthete himself and does a lot of work with multi-sensory experiences. Odette Toilette, which isn't her real name, is a, um, a smell and fragrance expert. This is uh, Paul A. Young, who's probably Britain's most famous or most uh, successful chocolatier, who's also a food inventor. Um, we collaborated with a, uh, an Italian company called Empatica, who were experimenting with um, biometric wristband technology um, for all, all, all different reasons. And the University of Sussex and a startup called Ultra Haptics, who were developing uh, a tactile stimulus technology using ultrasound to um, develop ways of stimulating the sensory touch, the uh, haptic uh, sensation. Uh, in midair. So we thought, okay, let's, let's really experiment. Um, and let's pick some works that engage with or, or in some way abstract. So we decided to take users on a journey through four artworks, not in any chron chronological order, from perhaps put, touching on very, very abstract works, right from works that are perhaps semi-abstract or semi-figurative. So I thought I'd take you on a walk through what Tate Sensorium was like. After you came in, you, this is the first work you were in, um, encountered with. As you'll notice, it isn't a white cube. It's a black cube, I suppose. Um, we decided that although we were putting lots of additional um, interpretation or experiences in there, um, we wanted all of those to focus you back on the visual. And we also, as part of our research, noticed that in a huge white cube gallery that is filled with abstract works of art, one of the hardest things to do is to focus on one single artwork. There's so much distraction. We thought, this, this is about focusing people. So we created a, a very dark environment, a spotlit environment. And in this, in this experience with um, uh, Richard Hamilton's interior number two, we created an um, audio olfactory experience, playing with some of the themes or some of the things touched on in the artwork. So as you went in, you were given a quote by the artist talking about what inspired him. It was a, f a film from the 1940s. Um, and we picked out smells in the painting, we picked out smells of the interior, we picked out smells of hairspray from the 1940s. Um, the research that we did with uh, Odette around smell was, she focused on memory. What is smell? Smell is the, the, the sense most associated with memory. And we wondered with this painting, could you uh, in, inspiring people a personal response. And we had so many people come through when we were testing it, one of whom was a BBC journalist who came in and the smell, he kept going on the smell of uh, pledge, 
floor polish, reminded him of his school in the 60s, going in on a Monday when they just polished the floor. Um, we also created an audio experience where we played both with uh, the subject matter of the painting, a woman in an apartment, we created sounds in an apartment of someone walking around on the floor, but we also create, played with the actual form of the artwork. So we played with sounds of cutting, um, tearing, these kinds of things, and played, uh, uh, played on that friction between abstraction and figuration. Um, so as you moved around the space, you got different elements of the artwork. Move forward, you got more figurative. Move backwards, you got more abstract and formal. Then you moved into the second room. This was a work that we really wanted to play with because it seemed to me to embody what people have trouble with, abstraction. Sometimes incredible simplicity, but with supposed profundity. This is a work called uh, Full Stop by John Latham, a very well-known British artist. And if you've ever read any of John Latham's writings, incredibly interesting, but incredibly dense, incredibly theoretical. He was interested in particle physics. He was interested in Zen philosophy. But we thought, imagine this in a gallery, you know, how it would be drowned out. When you spend time alone with it, it's incredibly uh, meditative, it's incredibly detailed, but imagine this in a gallery full of other works like it. You might walk straight past it, it doesn't do it justice. We wanted to play with the fact, we wanted to get those themes out without having to have a wall panel the size of this wall talking about all the million different influences. So we wanted to create a kind of um, a meditative space, again spotlit, the work, how it was made, again, playing with both the themes, but also how it was made, it was one of the first spray paintings he ever did. Um, so this is the ultra haptics device. We, the, Nick Ryan and the guys at University of Sussex worked very closely together to program it. And Nick played with sounds. He tried to play with sounds that were hollow, sounds that were solid. Um, but one of the things you don't notice when you walk past this painting is incredible detail. When you look very closely, you see how he's made it, how he's patched things up. You see all the intricate details. So in, in sync, you had a tactile sensation that brought those things out. Um, and this actually was the most favorite, uh, in the, the um, questionnaire that people filled out at the end, this came up as the most, uh, the favorite of, uh, experience of them all. People all said that, wow, actually, I would have walked straight past this artwork, but I spent so much time with it, and I wanted to spend more time with it. The third work was David Bomberg's In the Hold, and again, playing with this tension between figuration and abstraction between um, subject matter and material. We played with directional audio, so in that space when you moved forward and backwards, you got different experiences. There was things to smell in there. This is an artwork that you, is incredibly abstracted. It's a plane, the, the visual plane has been completely uh, geometrically uh, abstracted. But it's a, about, um, the, the ship, a cargo hold of a ship uh, pre-war. And if you spend enough time with it, you'll start picking things out and maybe noticing it. But again, we, we forced people to move forwards and backwards. Forwards, you heard sounds and smelt things relating to a cargo's ho a ship's hold, and you move backwards, and those things have been abstracted. Finally, and this is the one that got us lots of PR. <laughs> uh, people were very excited about it. This is Francis Bacon's uh, figure in a landscape. It's a very early Francis Bacon, but quite typically Francis Bacon. Um, it's a painting that he initially, it was initially inspired by a photograph of his lover having a sleep on a, a bench in Hyde Park, but because it was painted in 1945, it completely changed, its meanings changed, become a very dark, horrific portrait. So there's this inherent friction between two different um, references. So we wanted to play with that as well. So again, you had a, this is a full sensory experience. We played with sound, we played with taste, we played with tactility, with what you were asked to eat. Uh, and we played with smells. Um, to focus on what you ate, we worked with, as I say, a, a chocolatier. Now, that's not something you often get someone to do, is make a chocolate inspired by an artwork. And we were really frightened that people might see this as a bit silly or a bit, um, uh, yeah, a bit uh, taking the serious sub subject matter uh, for granted. Uh, and poor Paul has said he'd never been given a brief before to make something that tasted horrid. And that was the weirdest brief he'd ever had. But everyone, when you, when you looked at the responses on Twitter, when you looked at people coming out, all said, oh my God, it was weird, it was awful, but it was brilliant. We, we wanted to bring out, you can't see from this reproduction, but when you spend some time with it, this is a very grey artwork, but if you spend some time with it, you notice colours, you notice yellows, you notice oranges. So again, Bacon was trying to play, you could say, with that 
tension between pretty, wonderful landscape and this other horrible history, the 1940s context of the time. Um, again, you put this thing in your mouth and it's burnt, it's scorched, there was uh, charcoal, but there was also lapsang dusang tea uh, that really got people talking. So when you come to the end, you've worn a biometric wristband through all of this. The point of that was to track how you were responding to the sensory experiences. Of course, we can't read your mind and think, see what you were thinking. But that was tracking how you responded. And we also asked you to fill out a, um, an iPad questionnaire asking, not the normal questions asked in an art gallery, which did you find most intense? Which did you find most enjoyable? Which would you do again? How, which one would you, would you want more time? These kinds of things. And we correlated these two um, sets of data together. And first of all, shown you, give you a graph of how you responded over time. So this goes from the first experience, like a clock, right through. Uh, and everyone's was very, very different. We worked out whether you were a olfactory um, excited person or a uh, um, haptic excited person. We also told people what the experiences were that they'd had. And using that data, we give them a bespoke map of the rest of the gallery saying here's some works that we've chosen that we think could be interpreted or could imagine it would be thought about in, in relation to smell or in to touch. So if you know Tony Cragg, there was a huge Tony Cragg sculpture on it. Go and think about that in terms of touch. Don't touch it, but think about it in terms of touch. And push, essentially push them out into the rest of the gallery. You've had this very unusual, kind of weird experience with four artworks where you've actually spent about three minutes with each art, artwork, whereas the average dwell time in front of an artwork, I think in most galleries, is about 20 seconds. And we pushed them back out into the gallery. And what was brilliant to notice was how people had went from, in that previous slide with the wall captions, on their own, standing, looking, maybe looking a bit frightened, maybe trying to read something they don't understand, to with the friend that they came along with, because you could only go through in, in groups of four, uh, chatting, chat, 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 chat. They wanted to talk to each other. Oh my God, what did you think of that? Disagreeing, agreeing, uh, taking their map, going around the rest of Tate Britain, talking about art. Um, a bit like this guy, and I thought I'd include him. This is Simon Sharma, another connoisseur, stood in front of the potato eaters. That was just for Axel, because he's on next. Um, but love him or hate him, he's a brilliant TV personality, and he doesn't have, just have lots and lots of knowledge. He feels empowered to talk emphatically about what he loves. You'll often, when you, if, you've, if you've seen The Power of Art, when he's talking about the potato eaters, the language he uses, that you can't teach that. That's not em empirical truth. But he's talking about it being cloddy. He's talking about it being muddy, the way he's painted it. That's a sensual appreciation of art. That's not intellectual. But that's a really important start for you to reach the intellectual. We often start with saying audiences need to learn or be given factual information, theoretical interpretation, and that should lead them to a kind of personal, um, sensual appreciation of art. That's the wrong way around. You need to start with the sensual, and hopefully, if the museum and the artist and everyone else has done a good job, you should end up thinking, experiencing more intellectual things or relating that to information you know. So coming back to this, um, next time you're in a gallery or walking around here uh, later on today, I invite you to think, what does it make me feel and what does that make me think? Thank you.